Welcome to Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum and to Crossing Boundaries, the transmission of Rococo. Uh, I'm Sarah Coffin. I'm curator of, uh, in charge of the product design decorative arts department and co-curator with my colleagues um, Gail Davidson and Penelope hunter Stiebel, who are both here tonight as well as Ellen Lepton uh, of the exhibition. We have a wonderfully distinguished uh, group of uh, people here other, part, uh, other than myself who is not um, and to discuss this topic. Uh, in examining Rococo designs, one of the aspects that most interested me was the transmission of the style to different countries and how the style was translated locally. SOS, sinuous, organic, and sensuous, was the man mantra we used to help us focus as we looked at form as opposed to applied decoration on otherwise non-Rococo shapes. We stuck to the form as a uh, throughout um, and had tried to do so as we brought the subject forward into other centuries. Decked in a variety of clothing, the objects were fundamentally based on the rule of the S curve. The choices made for the clothing and some of the forms and materials were a mixture of imported style and lo local preference. How much was imported, where it was imported from, and why, all make the story of the diaspora a fascinating one to consider. While several fine exhibitions previously have examined Rococo designs in individual countries, France, England, the American colonies, and the Netherlands, no one has tried to look at the style across, board, across borders before, much less across centuries. Tonight we are going to concern ourselves with the 18th century with three extremely distinguished scholars, all of whom have contributed works and comments that have enlightened our presentation of Rococo design across borders. No exhibition or book can be accomplished without help. Not only do I have our guest tonight to thank along with the other curators and other authors, but also note with gratitude that Rococo, The Continuing Curve, 1730 to 2008, is made part possible in part by the Mondrian Foundation. It's also made possible in part by the Grand Marnier Foundation, Kay Allaire, the Consulate General of the Netherlands, Furthermore, a program of the J.M. Kaplan Fund and an anonymous donor. On a personal note, I would like to express my gratitude uh, additionally to the numerous fellow curators both here and at other museums who along with private lenders su supported us with some of their prizes leaving their exhibitions and homes to help us show Rococo design at the highest level. I will now introduce the three speakers uh, all at once, uh, rather than interrupting uh, between them. And then after Dr. Kuppa's presentation, I will return to the podium for a brief presentation of English Rococo before we start the panel discussion. <coughs> the first speaker uh, will be Henry Hawley, uh, Curator Emeritus um, at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, Henry, who has his uh, a bachelor's from Stanford and MAs from both Harvard and the University of Delaware, the Winterthur program, uh, was, long, uh, was the acquirer of the great uh, Meissonier Silver Tureen for the Cleveland Museum of Art, of which he was uh, a curator uh, from 17, excuse me, 1760, I've got 18th century <laughs> on the brain, <laughs> 1960 to 2002. Uh, he also served as a professor at Case Western Reserve and has been a Winterthur Fellow a winner, a winner of the Robert Smith Decorative Arts Society Award and uh, executive editor of Cleveland Studies and the History of Art from 1994 to 2002. Uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Rainier Barzin, who many of you know from his uh, work with us here, both in the graduate school and on the, uh, helping with the Piranesi uh, loans as well. Uh, um, he is at the Rijks Museum, uh, where he has been uh, since 1984, initially as curator of silver, uh, and uh, from 1988 to, ju to July 2006 as keeper of the Department of Sculpture and Decorative Arts. Uh, he's now senior curator of furniture following the merger of curatorial departments. Uh, you have also may have seen his reviews uh, in the Furniture History Society newsletter, um, and he has was co-curator of Courts and Colonies, the William and Mary uh, style in Holland, England, and America, which was here and at the Carnegie Institute. Um, and 
And the third panelist uh, and speaker is uh, Dr. Wolfram Köppe, who studied at the universities of Gießen and Munich and received his PhD, uh, where from which he received his PhD. He has been um, assistant curator for research at Philadelphia Museum and is now a curator in the Department of European <coughs> Sculpture and Decorative Arts uh, for nearly 16 years. He's author of numerous scholarly publications, uh, including uh, the uh, Lemmers Danforth Zamlung Wetzler uh, uh, co a Silver Collection, among other things, and the Princely Splendor, the Dresden Court, 1580 to 1620, as well as uh, the European Furniture in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, he's also uh, written numerous scholarly articles, a few of which have uh, greatly informed our work, uh, including um, an article uh, on the uh, the. Le Jou connection to the uh, snuff box, the Russian snuff boxes, and the presence of Le Jou in Russia, uh, which uh, which you will see the box that uh, is connected to that up in the exhibition, uh, as well as. Uh, other such publications, and most recently in his capacity as a, as a specialist on the furniture of Abraham and David Röntgen, he co-organized the Röntgen exhibition Edle Möbel für Höchste Kreise uh, in Neuwied uh, last year. So without further ado, I will welcome uh, Henry Hawley to the podium. We are going to have uh, these short uh, presentations uh, <coughs> followed by a panel discussion and I hope some uh, use uh, some interesting questions from all of you. Henry, welcome. Well, I wanted to start with an uh, uh, autobiographical bit. Um, I was a curator at the Cleveland Museum uh, from 1960 onward, and in the, I guess it was the summer of 1977, I became aware that the Maisonnier Tourines were coming up for sale at Christie's in November. And I had, all, I had been aware, of course, of these pieces. I hadn't seen them, nobody had. Uh, but uh, I thought that they were something that the art museum should at least consider. And I went to Sherman Lee and I managed to persuade him that this was not only a gorgeous work of art, but also of great historical importance, because it's one of the very few cases in which a work of decorative arts essentially forges a new style for a country. And I think that's really quite true. It was Maisonnier, and in particular, these pieces for the Duke of Kingston that made the Rococo style what it was in France in its most mature version. It had, there had been tendencies in that direction for a long time, but uh, they hadn't really been fulfilled until uh, the 1730s. Um, so at any rate, I uh, indicated that I'd like for the museum to get this, and so Sherman Lee got in touch with his counterpart at the Metropolitan Museum, and we entered into an agreement that the two museums would go together and bid for the, the Turines uh, when they were offered at, in Geneva um, in November. And uh, so we proceeded on that score, and about three weeks before the sale, the Met called up and said, sorry, we're going with the Louvre, not with you. <laughs> and so it was um, necessary to find another partner, and uh, on such short notice of only three weeks, it was almost impossible to get another museum. Uh, they all have to get the agreement of trustees and that sort of thing. So um, we got in touch with Baron Tissen, and he was interested in uh, this idea, and so we joined forces with him. And I went off to Geneva and looked at the Turines, and I thought they were very beautiful, and I came home. And then the art world was was just flooded with rumors about what was wrong with these terrines. They were no good, they were copies, they were, I don't know exactly what, but uh, something bad about them. And so uh, I didn't think it was true. I had seen them and I thought they were very beautiful. I also knew that there were problems with the, with the um, way that Christie's had described the marks on them. They had made an error. Uh, and 
I guess perhaps other people didn't know that. Uh, I heard that the French uh, curators thought that it was the Marx that made the pieces undesirable. At any rate, what we did uh, with Baron Thyssen, we uh, told Christie that we would like to bid for them, but we were unsure about their validity, and so uh, we would like to make a, an agreement that we could have a year to examine them, and if uh, we found anything wrong about them, we could return them and get our money back, and they were willing to do that. Uh, I think the, uh, the whole art world was so disturbed by these uh, rumors that they, <laughs> they were willing to do, do almost anything. So at any rate, the auction did go ahead and we got them. And um, probably because uh, the Louvre and the Met withdrew, I'm not sure about that, but I have a feeling that's what happened. At any rate, we, we got them and I was delighted. And um, I also had <coughs> heard some rumors about uh, documents in England that would be very revealing and so I went to London and uh, found the, the Kingston Papers among the uh, holdings of the National uh, Library there and in those uh, in those Kingston Papers there were references to the silver that he had bought in France and uh, there it was specific uh, descriptions that could only have been fulfilled by the Turines as they existed. So, uh, as far as I was concerned, that proved their uh, uh, genuineness. And, you know, they were also examined by other people on a, on a uh, more physical basis, and they stood up there too. So we got the Turines. Um, and very kindly, uh, Baron Thyssen allowed us to allow the museum to choose the one of the two we wished, and it was the one you see on the slide here. Um, I do think that, first of all, that Maisonnier is the primary uh, active uh, person as far as the Rococo style in France is concerned, and secondly, these things that he produced for uh, the Duke of Kingston are at the very top of the stylistic and uh, qualitative scheme that uh, evolved in France uh, concerning the Rococo. Uh, Maisonnier uh, came from a family of southern French origin. His father uh, was a silversmith and had removed himself from France to Turin. Uh, the seat of the uh, Savoy family's uh, holdings. And um, it was there that his son, Just Aurel uh, Maisonnier, was born in um, 1795. 1795. Um, and uh, the Maisonnier family was one that was very well equipped for producing uh, greatness in, in, as far as um, silversmithing was concerned. We know none of the father's works. They have all disappeared or not been discovered yet. But we know from the history of his activities there that he was very highly esteemed and very successful in Turin. And um, Just Aurel's first works were done in Turin making dyes from which coins could be struck. And then he went off in 1715, uh, 1715 to Paris doing very much the same kind of job in France, uh, making a, uh, a dye for a medal celebrating Louis XIV's uh, reign. Um, he, we're not quite sure whether he stayed entirely in France, but certainly by the 1719, he was a resident there because in that year he had a student who was mentioned as working with him. And then very shortly thereafter, he achieved the recognition of the king. Uh, first, he was named as um, a silversmith of, of the king in 17, 1724, and 
uh, in the next year he was registered in the uh, guilds list of silversmiths and then uh, in 1726 he was uh, given the title of um, de a designer of the chamber and the cabinet of the king. It was a, a job that Baron had held for many years and one that was very important. Uh, and so uh, he then uh, essentially began his work as a silversmith in, in France. And very quickly, he achieved fame. Um, he had good uh, contacts with members, not only uh, of the royal family, but uh, other high ups in uh, France. And his uh, production was therefore quite um, quite abundant, and as a uh, designer in the Rococo style, he was certainly uh, triumphant. Uh, among all of the people uh, in France who were working in the style by this time, his was by far and away the greatest. And he had the advantage of, in the 1730s, a production of a series of engravings after his designs, which were then made available to all of Europe. And so not only did uh, Maisonnier conquer France, but he also made his work widely available to the rest of, the, of Europe. Thank you very much. Um, contrast is a concept dear to Rococo. It was a way of describing the asymmetry that is so much uh, um, an, essential, an essential element of Rococo. So um, my presentation after the pinnacle of French Rococo, uh, shown as by Henry Horry in the masterpiece of, um, of Messonnier. Um, Holland doesn't deserve to come second in that way. It's not that uh, Holland was a great center of Rococo by any means, um, but within the, the theme of tonight, the dissemination of the style, it is, quite an interesting, it is quite an interesting country because it was a very highly developed, very prosperous country, which of course had had its great uh, flowering, in a sense, behind it, uh, but was still highly equipped to receive any kind of impulse from uh, foreign, foreign artistic developments. And in this very, very brief survey of a few things happening in Holland, I just want to uh, perhaps uh, highlight a few elements of the way the style was received there that I think are not unique to, uh, to Holland itself, but are very typical of what happened to Rococo all over Europe. In the first place, it was a craftsman's style. We hear that even in France itself, Maisonnier and La Joux and others who were, um, who, who, who were the great inventors, the great propagators of the style, although they might be termed architect, even a silversmith like Germain would style himself architect, but he never, he never designed a building. It was just that people designing crafts what we now call crafts or the decorative arts, came to such a status, came to such a pinnacle of position because of the decorative arts being so central that craftsmen, in a sense, took over from architects. Architects were rather snooty about Rococo. It wasn't, um, there was no relationship with architect architectural theory. The orders and the other elements uh, that had always been sacred to architecture and its theory <coughs> don't play much of a role in Rococo. There's more of a reaction. And in Holland, this is highlighted because there was no um, there was no great architect working in Holland in the first half of the 18th century. There was no court. We didn't have a statue at that time, and uh, there were not many buildings be, being erected because the cities really were big enough as they were. So something like this throne made for William IV, who became statue at the middle of the century, is made by is a sort of great 
piece of Rococo, of Dutch Rococo, there's no architect, there's no professional designer even involved. The bill mentions the chair maker and then the carver smothering it in ornament. And they're the ones who rule, in a sense, the development. They're the ones who lead the development. Um, so it's a craftsman style. And a sculptor like Xavieri, I mean, the first chair, of course, is upstairs in the exhibition, so you can see, it. sadly, this one isn't there because they make, again, a, ve a very good contrast. Here, a sculptor is taking charge. There is no chair maker. Uh, well, there possibly was a chair maker involved, but it's much more of a unity. The sculptor is taking charge, not the architect. And this, the sculptor who made this chair, Xavieri, <coughs> turns to designing chimney pieces, to designing interiors, takes over from the architect. And this is not just true in Holland. <coughs> this, is, this we see in many places. Um, a craftsman's style, a style that develops out of practice, not out of theory. And therefore, traveling craftsmen play a hugely important role. Uh, you can suddenly find something happening in a country that is rather unprecedented. It doesn't actually, you can't quite understand it from the developments that we know in that country. And it may just be the arriving of a single craftsman or a, of a group of them. Um, here again, a, a sculpted piece um, done by a great expression, actually, obviously a chandelier, no weight involved, something hanging up in the air, uh, very dear to everything essential to Rococo. Another important aspect in Holland is that the, 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 esse the essential idea of Rococo, that everything um, works together in order to create an environment where everything uh, responds to the new style is not true in Holland as it isn't true in most of the more uh, faraway centers. Um, there, are, there are newspaper advertisements in the middle of the 18th century where a sculptor um, advertises a piece like this so you could just go to his shop, buy it and probably hang it in a room uh, which is quite old-fashioned, just like taking one modern piece of, of art and um, putting it in an, in, in an environment <coughs> that didn't actually respond to that style. Quite opposed, obviously, to the great examples such as the Hôtel de Soubise, the Hôtel de Rouen, the great uh, famous, or, or indeed the interiors designed by Messonnier and diverged by him in his engravings, the great interiors where everything responded and where everything um, followed the central style. And a very good example of that is this very early Amsterdam Rococo chair, made <coughs> in surprisingly early in 1738. If it weren't documented, we wouldn't believe it because um, it, it, it is very precocious. Only in France would you find something quite as fully Rococo as that. And we also know the room it was made for. It was actually a fairly old-fashioned room. Again, made in 1738 at the same time, but more in the late Regence, rather tired manner that was, um, that was the fashion at the time in Holland and in which most interiors and most pieces of silver or decorative arts would be executed at, this, at the time. And as a great surprise, these highly modern, modern, as indeed the style was called um, at the time, chairs were chosen not at all uh, responding to the rest of the design of the room. Um, great exception is the Stadtholder of William IV, a, a first cousin to Frederick, Prince of Wales, and a first cousin to King Frederick the Great of Prussia, two great Rococo patrons in Europe, and he wanted to be the same, except he died rather young, only ruled for four years, and um, wasn't able to create very much. But this is a, a, a splendid example of a highly Rococo work of art created for him by an Italian sculptor. Agostino Carlini, who had come probably with an architect from Paris to The Hague, especially to work for the prince, 
and created, for instance, these extraordinary huge torchères for his country residence. And interestingly, when the prince died in 1751, Carlini stayed on for another one or two years, advertising a sleigh that he'd obviously made and wanted to sell and some other things, but he was too expensive and his ideas were too far flung, too highly developed um, to be able to attract patrons in the Netherlands, other patrons than the prince, who would uh, fall in with his ideas. So after a few years he left for England, where in fact um, his career took quite a different turn. John Mallet has recently suggested that he was involved in um, in, in fashioning some very uh, very highly Rococo um, sculptures made at Derby, but after that he became rather staid, he became a founding member of the Royal Academy and ra made rather dull marble busts and funeral monuments. So even in England he didn't find patrons who would go along with his very highly flung ideas, and it's this movement of a craftsman uh, or an artist. I mean, I think uh, the greatest artists of the Rococo period are the craftsmen, so perhaps we should try and look for other words. But taking a style with them from country to country, that is typical, again, of the dissemination of Rococo in Europe. Interestingly, William IV, obviously, and I, this is another thing I want to stress, I'm slightly sorry for the students who heard me speak this morning in their class, but I'm, this is sort of, well, I'm afraid I'm saying the same things again. Uh, as I want to point out the characteristics of Dutch Rococo, you're in for a bit of a repeat performance, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, but what is interesting about William IV is that even in his official works of art, even in the sort of outer works of art, he was very keen to support the Rococo style. He wanted to be seen to be a prince of Rococo, who wanted to be seen to be a prince who was embellishing his country, bringing in the newest, the latest in art, a great patron of the arts, and in that sense, um, he, he, he did that by very much um, supporting Rococo. Rococo, which was in essence created very much as a private style, not at all as an official, as a representative style, but simply by being le style moderne, it was not in France so much, but outside by Frederick the Great, or by Frederick, Prince of Wales, or by William IV. It was used to show that they were innovative princes, and so this private style took on um, a more or less official and political um, significance. And as a last, because I'm, sh I'm shown that I have no time left, but that's good because this is the last slide, I'm just showing you this image of the very young Prince William V, William IV, son who's going to visit the French ambassador um, in 1751 when he's three years old. But it's interesting because it shows the carriage that William IV had ordered um, at the time of his wedding, of his marriage to Anne of Hanover, the daughter of the King of England, of King George II. It was the costliest work of art he, bought, he, um, he, he uh, ordered in 1734 from the French royal coachmaker. And you can see, actually, in this later drawing, it already had Rococo elements. So this most <coughs> public work of art, the thing that you took with you out on the street, was um, a, a representation of being modern. And we see this uh, fanciful style taking on official overtones. Thank you very much. When you mentioned already uh, a keyword, and that is that sometimes it was enough that only one uh, craftsman or artisan arrived and to change something. And um, before with Messonnier, of course, we were on the upper court level. Um, then uh, in, in the Netherlands, we were in a very specific region. It's very difficult, different in Germany, where Germany didn't actually exist. Um, it was, I, I would call it the German-speaking cultural area. It was a patchwork um, like a, a assemblage of small states, of states which um, could be ruled by princes, but also could be ecclesiastical states. And um, of course, René mentioned that architects didn't have much influence. 
But in Germany, there was sort of a sideline that architects looked to the new forms and then together with designers um, merged um, the new forms into a style. And I want to start with one example. Uh, you see on the right, um, which is from um, an etching from 1665 uh, for Newhoff, uh, published from his um, series of an embassy to China. And you see these irregular rock formations, which were very important, I think, for the influence um, in the Rococo. And uh, today you still have them as remnants, um, as a very famous scholar rocks that are so much appreciated in China. And when you look to the right, you see the entrance to the Azamkirche in uh, Munich, which was built by the Azam brothers. Uh, one was a painter, the other one was a sculptor, and they wanted to create their own dream um, in the late Regence period and uh, started a church which would end up to have some Rococo decoration. But if you, which, which one does the, uh, ah, yeah. uh, If you look here, you have a natural rock formation. And it's very similar to this kind of thing. And it means two things, of course. One is that um, stylistically, it's something totally new. But on the other hand, it also follows um, the uh, laws of the church, because literally it takes into account the word of Christ towards um, St. Peter, that he said, you are the rock on which I will build my church. If we look in the inside, um, you have to imagine this church is like the size of a townhouse. Um, you still have the, the kind of Baroque uh, architecture, but it starts already with, with um, fake curtains, and especially in the high altar to have Rococo formations in a quite early period in the 30s of the 18th century. Um, going back to these natural forms, um, you have this old system of uh, nature and art. One is nature, of course, um, things that are created by nature are ultimately, ultimately created by God. And then you have art, which is the refinement by the humans. And um, some years ago, the Metropolitan was able to acquire this uh, pipe, um, which is very special because the lower part is antler. It's very irregular. It almost looks like a rocaille formation. And on the bottom is a shell-like formation. And then you have here where um, the oxygen could go in. And of course, you have, which is the overall subject of the exhibition, a curve. But in this um, case, it reminds you on the hooker, on the um, oriental form of the pipe. Uh, but it is very rococo in, in all its feeling. And also, it brings something together that is, is very German in the way, because um, hunting was limited to aristocracy, and um, antler was a natural material and um, had ascribed aphrodisiac powers, and so had the tobacco. And um, if you take this together, of course, you had a double doses. <laughs> Um, I show you what could happen in Germany when, when one uh, craftsman, what um, Renier uh, uh, mentioned, um, develops a specific style. And we, we have to take into account that the guild system in Germany was very regulating and very important, which means that when you became a journeyman, you had to go for two or three years and to travel, to go to other centers. And very often, you would stay there. You would marry the daughter of a master, take over a workshop. but. Um, Sometimes you would also come back and bring back these new influences. And this, uh, sorry, um, this is a traveling set on the uh, left, which um, is in the Metropolitan. And it's 
was made in Augsburg, the main center uh, for goldsmith's work at the period um, between 17... Uh, 50 um, 53 and 55, and then just 10 years later, you have this one, which is in the Museum of Augsburg. It's made by um, Johann Georg Satzka. We, upstairs in the exhibition, you see a box of his, um, and you see already the, the form, the rocaille form, the movement, everything is taking over uh, the object in, it, in itself. You see the mirror, has only moving forms, and just 10 years before, you had already little rocaille formations, but you had still a symmetrical form which reigned, which dominated um, the object. If, if we go further, there is a relation, in, especially in South Germany, between architecture and furniture, but it is limited mostly to uh, regions that um, were under uh, the Catholic influence. And this is one of the pieces um, which uh, were made by a, a craftsman to become the member of a guild. It's a chef d'oeuvre, a masterpiece of the uh, Cabinet Makers Guild in Mainz. Uh, in Germany, and they had to make this piece within 12 weeks after a certain requirement. First they had to do a drawing, and they had to show that they had a tech architectural knowledge, that the proportions were right. And that shows you how these arts were connected with each other, architecture and the craftsmanship, what what Renier already indicated, um, it was not a very strong division as we would do it today. At the time, it was much more important and it was actually a requirement for uh, an artisan, I would call them, um, to be able to know the orders of the columns and so on. And on the other side, you see the uh, uh, middle altarpiece in the church of the 14 cents, um, in Franconia, and you see this very light baldachin, and you see how close this is together. If we go further, this is um, a long case clock which was made in Würzburg for the Prince Bishop of Würzburg, and you have this very light um, crowning here of Rokai formations, and it's very similar in feeling to that, but the body is um, sort of a, a still can't get loose, can't, can't let loose the, the massive Baroque feeling. You really think that this here is like, like leather belts hold, holding the weight. Um, but if we compare the two, uh, here, I'm uh, sorry that this is black and white. You have an, a de detail of the um, long case clock which was made for Prince Bishop, and that one was made for, for a Hanseatic um, merchant in Hamburg. And there, the ornament really takes over completely. You have nothing else than Wokai, and it was made in the 1770s, and very typically for North Germany in, in that way. Um, if we go to Berlin, you have a very different approach. When uh, you mentioned already Frederick the Great as one of the great patrons of the art, and if you see these etchings, this etching uh, by Hoppenhaupt, and you see details, you have these t tiny little motifs uh, here, like um, uh, like a floral element coming out. And if you combine them together, you get things like this handle of a bell, which is very light in comparison to the body of the piece. Um, but then towards the end of the reign of Frederick the Great, you still have the influence of um, the Rococo here, but uh, very typical for Berlin, you have the natural element, you have the full-blown roses. Um, they play it silvered uh, in opposite to France, where the, the mounds were always gilded. And then you have here mother of pearl, ivory, and you have tortoise shell. So again, you have the play between the materials, between the silver and um, the uh, exotic materials which were appreciated so much at the period. 
and this is something very uniquely German, and there it, the, the curve simply stops. Um, that you can imagine in one drawing by a cabinet maker to have two alternating solutions. One um, is a totally uh, Rococo dominated form of an armoire, uh, most likely drawn in North Germany with this fully developed Rokai formation, but at the same time you have the pure neoclassicism without any, any um, little detail of transition. And that is typical that these two styles in the German-speaking areas could exist for uh, a period of 15 years, I would say, from, the, from 65 um, up to 80, next to each other. And uh, one, of course, was a modern one, but the other one was still considered to be appropriate. And that's very typical for the German-speaking area. Well, when in uh, um, preparing this, I must say, in addition, all the thanks from before, obviously we are extremely grateful, and uh, both uh, Rignier and uh, Wolfram particularly uh, came forward with some extraordinary stars uh, from their collections, and we saw a few of them on the screen, um, but, um, and obviously uh, Henry um, having acquired the, one of the greatest stars, and Cleveland has a number of them thanks to his acquisitions. I'm now just going to briefly um, briefly uh, discuss a few things about England um, so that we uh, uh, round out the general picture, although we're not covering a number of areas. Um, obviously, we might well begin this uh, chat with um, William Hogarth and the line of beauty of uh, 1745 and the uh, critical role he played through the uh, St. Martin's Lane Academy, where so many of both the foreign-born and the um, uh, English-born uh, art designers, uh, furniture makers, draftsmen, and so on, all came together, uh, heavily uh, taught by uh, Gravelot, Hubert Francois Gravelot. On the left is a drawing from our collection here, which is not on view, um, but it was uh, believed to be in the collection of Horace Walpole, and it's the design uh, for an ornamental border uh, that was later, uh, which was used um, in the, to surround, um, the, the, his design surrounded the tapestry designs from John Pine's tapestry hangings in the House of Lords, published in 1739. On the right is a snuff box by Francis Arash, but what is particularly interesting about it is that it is signed by Thomas Burgess, who was in fact um, a student at St. Martin's Lane and later became a founding member of the Royal Academy as an artist. And uh, I think the, certainly the uh, Gravelow's influence uh, going forward. Linnell was another, John Linnell, the furniture maker, was another st student at the St. Martin's Lane Academy, which was right across the street from Thomas Chippendale's workshop, and he may well have gone there, but there's no record of that. In any case, they all met up at Slaughter's Coffee House. Uh, Mark Sherward has done a wonderful study of all that um, in a series of articles in Country Life some time ago. And on the right, a fire screen that is from a private collection, which is um, uh, on exhibition now, and uh, is very similar in feel to the works of Linnell and actually its uh, original uh, needlework. And I think through this, you will see it is the carvers, very much in the carvers, the carvers of wood, uh, carvers and modelers, I should say, and carvers of stucco who, uh, who come and bring Rococo to England. Uh, on the left is a design by George Michael Mose, a Swiss German who came uh, to London and obviously was a specialist in enameling as well as in um, chasing, but he actually started his career in England inlaying brass into furniture. So again, uh, there's a certain crossing of media. And my, my belief is about St. Martin's Lane Academy, these people met and worked and the, the, in the art of modeling uh, for the uh, gold and silversmithing, uh, they uh, obviously did cross uh, boundaries of what uh, what they were working in. It wasn't quite as strict as it might have seemed uh, from the point of view of furniture making, makers making furniture on the and silver makers 
uh, making silver. I don't think silver makers were making furniture, but I do think that people doing modeling for porcelain and silver were often the same. Uh, the On the right is a watch that actually made in London, but has on the actual face of the watch retailed by Thomas Gordon in New York. This was retailed at, in about 1760 in New York and therefore shows that uh, high style London design was reaching this country. A smorgasbord of the sort of great goldsmithing uh, of London um, well, an Ormolu work, some Ormolu work up on the top. Uh, very Germanic feel to the automaton by James Upjohn on the top right. Um, but And perhaps for a German client, there's a um, Roger Smith, an automaton specialist, has just written an article where it's shown another one with, from the Imperial Collection in Beijing. These things went out. The English were great toy makers. There was a whole category of salespeople called toy makers, and they went out around the world. Obviously, the highly portable did too and English works were highly sought after in other parts of Europe. The etui on the left being English. Uh, the box on the right is probably Dresden, but uh, in fact it bears a great similarity. All of them bear great similarities to some uh, fair amount of German engravings at the time, um, but it, uh, could e it could be uh, made in London. And then this, which may have been made for the Russian uh, crown, there's some Russian on it, but again, a, uh, the St. James factory, Charles Goyne listed as both the uh, head of the St. James porcelain factory as well as a toy maker. This may well have been in co concert with with James Cox, the more famous one. This is an interesting example from the Cleveland Museum on the left of a gilt bronze work that I think might, um, I am suggesting an attribution to uh, Johann, uh, John Valentine Haidt, who is also um, known as Johann, and a uh, German immigrant into London and clearly related to the Augsburg family of the same name. And as you will see, it's a gilt bronze, and I think Modelo, for the silver gilt basin by Paul de Lammer on the right, and I suspect it was made in London, perhaps even um, uh, for as a model for De Lamery, but he must have hired a different modeler to do to work on parts of it, because the border was completely changed and rendered quite a bit more Rococo in the final version made for uh, the um, uh, Earl of Ilchester in about 1740. Uh, clearly, there's a great correlation between Ger the flow in Fr in uh, England is not just from France; it's also from Italy with the stucco workers and um, and Germany back and forth both ways because George II was spending a great deal of his time going back and forth from Hanover. Uh, and this is a cabinet in the middle um, made uh, for George the the second. What am I saying? Um, with his monogram up in the middle, up here, and a German. Um, uh, cabinet, bureau cabinet by Michael Kummel from Dresden of about 1750 and on the left is one by John Channon uh, in London a very similar period and uh, Channon was uh, in London for overlapping one year with Abraham Rentgen who also um, then went back to Germany. So again, the German-London connection. And I just show one other um, aspect of the German influence now back in this side of the Atlantic, but potentially through uh, London. And that is with a work identified by Tom Savage recently um, as the uh, a federal piece, but by a man named Martin Feniger. And clearly, I think he may have been a Moravian because there was a Moravian colony in Charleston. And certainly, a a Röntgen was, in fact, headed to the Carolinas um, uh, when he got shipwrecked um, in Ireland and spent some time there and never got there. But, um, but indeed, uh, Feniger may well have been a German uh, Moravian who came to Charleston and uh, showed his influence of Rococo uh, marquetry work on an otherwise neoclassical piece, uh, as we saw a German tendency with Vol uh, Wolfram. And then uh, quickly moving on with the Amer English and American in metalwork, here we have Paul de Lamery made for a Philadelphia family and the great Joseph Richardson, the Philadelphia piece, clearly of similar form and yet so very different in their interpretation. Uh, this was uh, made for a wedding of the Franks family in Philadelphia, um, but sent from London by their relatives, and Richardson knew it, and I think they've been reunited in the same place for the first time since the 18th century. What is strikingly different is how important the chaser is to the ultimate role, and chasers being specialists like carvers, 
and you have old-fashioned tulips and uh, flower arrangements uh, that might have been 50 years ago, uh, 50 years previously, uh, on the Richardson piece uh, from the design and yet extremely up-to-date engraving. So it's an interesting mix to see this transported. Likewise, we have the influence of a Whippham and Wright, an English coffee pot, which is, has these spiraling flutes, clearly in the Rococo mode, but a slightly subdued version of compared to some of the Europe continent European ones, but in this case it's very important these peanut designs as they are known, uh, the cabochons picked up uh, by and asked for by the Cadwallader family for whom this was uh, a wedding present um, and they had the decoration of their house and included the furniture designs, um, incorporated it into the furniture along with some of the scrolling foliage that appears on the knees of this very serpentine table uh, made for, the, uh, for them by a uh, Thomas Affleck's workshop. What is again interesting is this and its pair have two different um, two different uh, carvers to them, so he clearly had to outsource some of the carving. And lastly, this mystery piece, um, or the furniture, made probably, I think, by a carver, a table made by a carver. And when I looked at that chair that uh, Rainier was showing, uh, it seems to me there's a great similarity and feel of the idea of the carver working on a piece of furniture. It's essentially a one piece uh, object. And then I mentioned stucco work. Here we have Hagley Hall in Worcester and the Powell House in Philadelphia. We do not have the um, Cadwallader House to show, but there was similar stucco work. Again, uh, perhaps come Italians coming from uh, through Germany and to England. So there are two waves blowing through England, one from France, more and indirectly France through Holland with some of the metalsmiths uh, and uh, the other perhaps uh, back and forth from Germany and the Netherlands. So backing up in history, um, one of the things that's certainly important in England and perhaps in the Netherlands, but not necessarily, uh, which we would like, I'd like to explore, is that with the, the revocation of the Edict of Nantes and the fl flight of Huguenots from France in 1685, uh, many in England settled and subsequent generations of their family indeed stayed in silversmithing and goldsmithing. And the quality of the workmanship was very high contributing, I think, to very some of the high craftsmanship um, that put, it, it, at, even still in the Rococo time, somewhat after, well after the generation that left France. And I was wondering whether the uh, importation or the, the movement of Huguenots, um, how you felt, whether you felt that had an impact on the quality of, of Rococo, I'll start with you, Rainier, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, it certainly had a great impact at the period of William and, and Mary. Right. Uh, so the sort of French Louis XIV style very much came through Marot, but also through a lot, many craftsmen, tapissier, carvers, silversmith. But um, we don't find many, many descendants of those yeah. working in the Rococo period. There's some French goldsmith working in, in, in Amsterdam right. who are actually in the, in the avant-garde of Rococo in Holland, but, but they come straight from France at right. that moment. Right. So you don't, you don't get great Huguenot families. I mean, there are lots of Huguenot families in Holland, but you don't get... As far as I they know, they didn't stay in the profession. They didn't stay in the profession, right? Oh, that's very interesting. I think they, they very they often, often became. They very often became uh, quite quickly. They became rather well off and turned, you know, became house owners and sort of uh, uh, merchants, possibly rather than craftsmen. Right. I think that happened quite quickly. And we don't see many second generation Huguenots uh, working. And is that fairly true of the German uh, speaking areas as well? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are two exceptions. One is Berlin, where you have some continuation mm -hmm. and also new people coming in uh, from France. Um, and the other one, strange wise, is Kassel uh, in Hesse because um, we don't know why. Um, the situation was that way, but there was a huge concentration of Huguenots, and especially in, in working as silversmiths, mm -hmm. and they continued mm -hmm. up to the classicism. Mm -hmm. 
and Henry, I was and in a going in the reverse direction. Um, perhaps the absence of Huguenots in in France. Uh, um, do you find that? Uh, do you think that this contribute to the um, the importation, shall we say, of of uh, other craftsmen from uh, either other parts of France or other countries, um, not just necessarily? Well, the, I would say that the chief importation of craftsmen from other countries was in the realm of furniture, and they mostly came from the Netherlands and Germany. Right. Apart from obvious, I mean, Meissonier being essentially French, but yes. having run, been lived in Turin. But. Well, uh, Yes, but I think the the family did retain some connections with France. Right. And, okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, I bet I bet certainly it's an interesting uh, phenomenon because some do also go, you know, um, also then develop country, clients in the countries they came from for the for their per Paris produced works because they were in the highest fashion. I think in the furniture world. I mean. Well, it's certainly true that. Uh, my friend Lotz had uh, royal German uh, 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 customers. Right, exa exactly. So that which is in fact leads me to my next question. Um, I observed in at least in some of the uh, particular patrons that one knows um, the, perhaps the best, such as Frederick Prince of Wales uh, being the more flamboyant character in England as opposed to George II and uh, Horace Walpole as opposed to Robert Walpole with his staid Palladianism. There seems to be a certain personality type uh, of some of the foreign patrons um, a, a, that goes along with the flamboyance perhaps of the Rococo style. But does one, f does that have any, do you find that uh, or do you, th I find that in many cases power uh, is often equated with classicism and solidity. It was very interesting to see your presentation of Rainier about uh, William the Fourth of Orange and how, and uh, you were mentioning about Frederick the Great that uh, they were using this private and somewhat uh, more intimate style for uh, public and more uh, purposes. But the actual personalities of the individuals, do you feel that is a, it comes into play? But I, no, I, I think it's very much the, the case that the, the, the princes of the middle of the 18th century, and I think Louis XV included, um, possibly mainly through his mistresses. I mean, Madame de Pompadour having a huge influence, but I think Louis XV himself was, was very involved. I think there is that phase in the middle of the 18th century when young princes uh, want to be seen to be embellishing embellishing their country and to be to bring innovation everything uh, it's a period when young people are very interested but I think that was more or less always the case but it's very outspoken uh, in the middle of the 18th century we're very um, interested in being avant-garde mm -hmm. and 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 it's true with all those princes with Frederick the Great with Louis the 15th with William the fourth that their successors are fairly staid mm -hmm. and um, although again they obviously <coughs> propagate the new style, they propagate neoclassicism. It's rather a dull neoclassicism and they're interested in clocks and things like that. They become, <laughs> and they, it's true of all of them. It's a funny thing at the end of the 18th century that, um, well, of course there are some exceptions, but um, it's as if the great energy that's there at the middle of the century in, in, with rulers, but I, 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 don't think, I don't think power combines with, with classicism. You know, if you think of the mm. church triumphant, mm. especially in, in, in southern, well, Germany southern Germany or in yes. Italy, uh, I mean all those extraordinary mm. Rococo churches that are made by, that, that are built by convents and churches, you know, to show their great power and to show their great importance and their richness. I think one of the best examples is a residence in Würzburg, oh. right. where you have the near the classicism that uh, that goes through from uh, from the 
I think, from the 16th century up to the 18th century in, on the ruler's uh, level. But um, you have it in the staircase, but then of course you have the ceiling painted by Tiepolo, and as soon as you enter the next reception hall, you have this wonderful stucco work by Antonio Bossi, which is as Rococo as it can get, to, but it is uh, monochrome in white, just to prepare you that when you enter the next room, which is the Imperial Reception Hall, you have again Tiepolo, but um, framed colorfully in gilded rocai and and lively, as it would be as it would be the desire to have heaven on earth. Would this be, would this be a case though where the the public, I mean the people who would have least access on the outside, would be the ones seeing this more classical facade, and that if you had the uh, status to enter, you would be then sort of increasingly um, rococo and heavenly bound. <laughs> yes, but in the, in this case, it's really a, a very calculated um, propaganda architecture from. Uh, Lukas von Hildebrand, but um, uh, Balthasar Neumann was the chief architect, that you have the vestibule and then you have uh, in 90 degrees uh, turn, you have the, the grand staircase, then again 90 degrees, you have the, the white hall, and then you enter again um, with, with the uh, order of the sequences, the imperial reception hall, and then you sort of have to work your way down to the throne hall. And um, by then, I think when you arrived, you were already breathless. So yes. it's, <laughs> it's sort of a preparation. Right. It prepares you that you come, you have to go up the staircase to see the prince, and until you arrive, right. you are already totally impressed. Yes, yes, right, absolutely. In the line of patronage, it's often been said, Henry, that um, that Meissonier was at his most rococo for foreign patrons. Um, the Duke of Kingston, uh, the uh, Count Belinsky cabinet, yes. um, some of the other things, um, kings of Portugal. Do you think that our impression of uh, his work is partly unbalanced because of the lack of, I mean, the potential for some of his work to have been obviously destroyed if it remained in France during the time of the revolution? Or well, do you, much uh, of it was destroyed, right, there's no doubt. So, or do you feel that that's an accurate um, statement about... Well, what? I think, frankly, that, that there was a sort of remaining resistance in France to the Rococo. The, uh, the Truvian ideals never completely disappeared. And uh, so I think especially in, in amongst the um, upper echelons of the royal family, although they did on <laughs> some occasions make use of, of Meissonier's talent, uh, I think there was a resistance and, and it was not as successful it's as It's interesting you should say that because in the exhibition and in Cooper Hewitt's collection we have a candela we have a pair of candelabra by uh, Claude Ballin and the base is really quite Vitruvian compared to the rather more uh, ebullient uh, scrolly um, uh, branches and uh, Wolfram uh, wrote a uh, wonderful article that informed my un uh, under having noticed the visual Similarities with uh, German, both German candelabra and the Spanish ones, uh, the the sources of this. But of course, he, Balin, both did uh, do a great deal of work for the royal family. And yeah. uh, as um, Wolfram has correctly noted in his article, obviously, um, the the patrons abroad for his work uh, enabled uh, the local makers to um, Ingerman and Fausti in Spain um, to make uh, uh, similar examples or copies um, from if, them. If I recall correctly, Balan was responsible for the day-to-day -day service that the King of France used. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. there were some other silversmiths who had royal appointments, but uh, Balan was certainly very 
very high amongst them. <laughs> right, and it, as, I, as, as I said, I, although Rococo in the base, it certainly is somewhat yes. more conservative <laughs> than anything that, that we're showing, I mean, the, than the Meissonier candelabra right. for the Duke yes. of Kingston and so forth. It's so nice that you have upstairs a juxtaposition of the Ingermann candelabra together with the Bala, because there you see that, that Dresden, um, the ornament, tries to take over. Yes. The, the, the form completely, right, it's and a, and everything tries to swivel and has has a nervous surface, in in comparison to the bala where you have some areas which are just the plain reflecting silver. That uh, thank you because that is. Uh, the, therein is what we are talking about, the translation, where the, t the one is the model, but the other has a completely different feel to it, even then, though it's, there's clearly a source, uh, source of inf information. Unfortunately, I'd hoped we would be able to find the um, Spanish ones, but the um, owner, when last seen, has died, and, they, and the uh, present owner seems to be unknown, uh, uh, whereabouts unknown. So, um, so we, uh, will, we will hope someday they will serve and that we can have all of them in the same place. But, uh, well, it, it, there, but there was even an, I'm sorry oh, to interrupt ahead, you, there was even an Italian variant that turned ah. up which came it's from the Palazzo Rospigliosi. Right. So right. Um, it would be interesting to see one day them together. Right, Absol absolutely. And, that, and, and it's so interesting because they are not the same. And then um, thanks to a uh, a lender who, again, Wolfram uh, brought us to, uh, we have the upstairs a very interesting example of also of the mix of the idea of the Hohenzollern family having a candelabrum where the top is 18th century and they apparently mixed and matched and the bases are late 19th century Berlin, Gregor mm -hmm. Bruder Friedländer. And I think it's interesting to see that in another period um, that this was perceived to go perfectly well together, and our eyes see the difference. But um, do you think the, do you think at the time that uh, the bases were perceived to be interchangeable with the 18th century ones? Or uh, no, I think this was really um, one of these eras of history when, when uh, William II went into ex exile. He took, I think, six of these candelabras together with the original basis, and he had extra candelabras which were copies by Friedlander. Okay. And when parts of the things that are today in Houston uh, were um, given to his children, I think um, his daughter Cecil, she, she got quite a lot, um, then these pieces were mixed up by mistake. <laughs> right, I, I didn't know whether perhaps there were Right, extra, extras. But in other words, it wasn't that they were were used together at, intentionally, or no, because because the base, um, if you look at it, the base is is a little bit out of proportion. Yes. It's a little bit too high, right. and it has three little holes, which means that originally it had a lead filling right. to to be very stable on the table. And um, years ago, uh, a pair came up at auction in Berlin, um, the same model, but uh, not with five um, uh, candle holders, but it had 12. Uh -huh. and, and so it had a different weight. Right. And if you imagine in dining in the late 19th century, you had this very high um, uh, candles that you actually could see your opposite um, right. on on the table, and uh, so they had to have a certain weight right. Um, right. to stand stable on the table. Right. I yeah. See. Oh, that's that's very interesting. It's one of the ironies of history that that when when um, right. uh, William II was a, was allowed to take things out of the castle in Berlin and out of other. Um, um, Castle said he he made very odd choices. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, we all have uh, some. Uh, uh, it certainly, uh, I think they probably even the selection of uh, of what people chose to uh, chose to. Ha 
purchase it at the time, I mean, uh, that certainly within the 18th century, obviously, uh, criticism was already running thick that, um, that Rococo was uh, too much and that perhaps people were being faulted for having uh, acquired them in the first place. But rather interesting that in England um, uh, that already perhaps, again, our flamboyant character, the future George IV, and some of the um, people were otherwise uh, having additions made to 18th century Rococo uh, table services and side and wine coolers and things, um, it either both as reproductions or in the general man Rococo manner as early as 1810, 9 or 10. So it's quite... Or maybe it, even 6. Yeah, maybe even 6. Yeah, so I mean, it's very early. And then I does, it right early. at a time when neoclassicism, like Germany, were at an earlier phase where they're both um, going on at the same time. Time is there, is there much of that in the when the Rococo stops in um, the Netherlands? Is it pretty much a sort of cut, you know, a cut? And is there a reason in terms of change of of uh, stadtholder or? No, well, there's a cut, um, but like in Germany, and I think even in France, really, you have a coexistence for quite a while of um, sort of late Rococo things, transitional things, which right. mix in, in often in a quite odd way, Rococo characteristics and, and mm -hmm. neoclassical characteristics. Mm -hmm. But I think that happens in, in every country. And straight neoclassical pieces. But then the, the, the style does die out. And we don't have, as far as we know, we don't have this very, very early um, neo-rococo that you get, I think, in England much earlier right. also than you get it in France. Right. Um, and it's really, it's the beginning of, of, of um, I mean, George IV being very much an example of somebody who really almost from 1790, from the moment of the French Revolution, is trying to buy antiques, is suddenly getting interested. Um, it's a real change, it's a real um, a moment of change where, where he wants to acquire, and with him, many of the English aristocrats who can get over, and of course feel that there is this wonderful opportunity to, to, to buy those great works of art, and suddenly it doesn't need to be in the latest style. All of the sudden, like Lord Lassels, who is in, well, many of the English are in, in Paris in 1802 because of, uh, there is an uh, interruption of the blocka blockade. And then they all buy, they try to buy great works of art from the Ancien Regime, and they suddenly are as interested um, in, in Louis XV, in Rococo pieces, as in things that might seem to be modern. And we don't have, we don't get that in, in Holland. I think that goes very much in the English uh, historicism overall. I mean, you, you find this intense interest in Gothic. I mean, no, I don't think there are very many other countries where Rococo and Gothic are mixed together. I mean, in, in, it would be at a Chippendale Tierbeck, but it's also uh, Welbeck Abbey and having things that would appear to be 17th century made in the 1740s and, and so we on. We have so, that as well. Yeah, that, that we get. That, I think you get you that, get but I think I may perhaps Perhaps it is part of that sort of interest in the ancient. I think we'd, uh, we'd love to ha have some questions or uh, comments or addressed to any of the panelists from the uh, audience, or whether you have any questions um, about what you've heard tonight or about anything else on the topic is uh, fine. Um, is it same? Right back in the back. Yeah. I had a question for Wolfram, which is um, post-German unification, German reunification in 1989. I'm wondering if avenues of scholarship previously closed have opened up in Germany, and if particular pieces have been, particular German Rococo pieces have been rediscovered, um, or new areas of scholarship unearthed. Well, they have certainly um, picked up with giving access to the objects. Um, before it was rather difficult to, uh, it, um, it was out of discussion to go in a, in a deposit or something, but it was still, of course, um, even difficult to, to handle objects or or to, to get the right access. But um, 
it had a lot to do then with the new uh, kind of merging of museums. In, in Berlin, for example, the two museums of decorative arts, one was in the east, which was located in Köpenick Castle, and the other one um, in the west, uh, which is um, a kind of um, strange building from from uh, the design is from the 60s but it uh, was um, not finished until the 70s uh, it looked looked at the time very outdated and um, has a lot of problems for installation but um, when these two collections merged and they they came together then they realized in the meantime the rest had tried to make up for some losses and to acquire things. And um, f that brought uh, some great assets, like, for example, in the case of the of Röntgen furniture, that, that now they have one of the most important collections because of that accumulation. Uh, in, in other ways, in some of the castles, um, it's quite surprising what was just sitting in the attic and um, turned out to be examined only uh, during the the whole process of restitution that families came and said um, we uh, have a claim to these and those pieces um, where are they did they go to a decorative arts museum or did they stay in the castle or were they stolen by by the uh, the um, troops that occupied um, the eastern part of Germany, and um, some amazing discoveries were made here. Yeah. But I think it, it will take at least another uh, decade or, or even another generation until we realize the full extent of that. Did you find any uh, sort of uh, unanticipated regional differences um, by pieces that came to light um, in sense of, of, I mean, regional differences of the 18th century that hadn't been, f uh, or were the pieces well enough documented? Um, well, mo most pieces were documented in the, in the way that before the war there were already quite some some good publications of the major objects. Mm -hmm. But uh, then during the war there was a, a, a very thorough um, campaign to photograph a lot of objects. But of course from, from photographs you can't judge exactly what you are looking at. Right. And you have to have the original. And now there is um, another need that most of these pieces um, were dormant somewhere for decades, and of course they need restoration. And, right. and this conservation process is now the opportunity to bring them back to life and, and then also to recognize differences. Right, that's interesting. We have a question back here. Okay, um, we heard that um, the new style was spread mainly by moving craftsmen. But do we have uh, proof that we had some, let's like um, um, example uh, prints or uh, work um, workbooks or, or something engravings that were uh, published and used by different workshops and manufacturers, for example, in the in the in Europe? Well, certainly Maisonnier had had a lot of uh, engravings of his work, and they were distributed elsewhere in Europe. How much they were used, I'm afraid I can't tell you. I really don't know exactly how much they were used by other. Well, I think it, they certainly his um, the his oeuvre was already in London in the 1730s, and uh, along with Gravelo also doing his own interpretations, and um, and his and other French designers such as Pinot was uh, um, borrowed, shall we say, appropriate appropriated by Batty Langley for his book and other mm -hmm. ways that 
that local, somebody local might appropriate a design, but um, definitely the source of, of, in goldsmithing in particular, um, uh, the sort of, or smaller objects, or through, uh, through uh, other uh, designers working from his engravings. Yeah. But, but also, obviously, at the Meissen factory had them, and um, uh, as from the candlestick you can see upstairs in the designs, and, and uh, undoubtedly, uh, you know, well, it was the source of the high fashion. What about well, certainly 1734, which is the year in which the first uh, series of engravings, not just by Messonnier, but by Lajou and others, it's, it's a sort of seminal year for the first uh, true Jean pittoresque engravings being published. And, and for instance, in Holland, but I think also in, in Germany and other regions, you see like something that has come from another planet in the work of artists whose work we know from years before as well. All of the sudden, these quite isolated elements of, of rocaille all of the sudden appearing. So uh, there, very clearly, I think the, the engravings had this, had this effect. But I, I, I do think that in design history, often uh, the importance of engravings tends to be slightly overrated. Obviously, they were used. They were a very important means. But almost as Wolfram is saying about, you know, when you see a photograph of something, you still cannot judge what it's like. You can't judge its actual, actual effect. And I think it's very true of, of an object as well. So um, engravings we can often document of, have, of having traveled. But visitors took objects, saw things, took objects home with them. Journeymen were working in other countries and seeing objects being made. And I think the, it's true, it was true in the 18th century the way it's true now, that if you don't actually have experienced the impact of the realized object, it's going to be quite difficult to be sufficiently influenced by a two-dimensional <coughs> engraving or design to actually, I think, adopt the style. So I think, so they help the process, but they can't independently create the process. I think, I think it's several things happening at the same time. That's one reason we included so many snuff boxes in the exhibition, because it's a highly transportable, highly <coughs> valuable gift that gets given and, for, and often was sold, um, also because uh, it was a sort of a form of, of, of financial reward as well, often. And if you could afford to keep it, that was also a statement. But those snuff boxes moved with people as a highly transportable uh, form of getting the art out there, but in Germany. But I think we should not forget one point that these um, decorative prints were also collector's items right. by yes. themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, if you are very lucky and you don't, uh, they didn't get chopped up uh, and, and sold separately, some of them are extremely elaborately bound. In, in, in wonderful bindings, leather bindings, and uh, for example, René um, um, mentioned La Joux, uh, Catherine the Great had all these prints which influenced the Russian Goldsmith's work. And uh, the other point is with the snuff boxes, what you said, there's one story of, of um, Frederick the Great that he sends one, one of his friends to uh, Paris to look for the latest fashion. And he said, please bring me the best snuff box that you can get that we have a model to follow. And I think that says a lot that everybody was sort of looking to France, but um, uh, looking to to something, and then in the age of mercantilism, of course, you, you had to respect your own e economy, and um, you couldn't only buy luxury goods um, in foreign countries, because that would have disturbed the whole economy. Henry, do you think the um, economy, <coughs> the French economy, um, was was rely reliant on exporting of fashion, so to speak? Then I, mean, okay. I think it certainly was an important factor, no doubt. Right. No, I think that's a very textiles good very much. Yes, you know, textiles were imp French textiles were imported everywhere and at huge cost. Yes, and they were a thing that almost nobody could really manage to to copy. 
I mean, what the French were so good at was developing some crafts that, like guild bronze, for instance, that nobody really could because, because of their guild organization and because of the huge concentration of, of, of craftsmen working in that field, um, nobody could really quite compete. So whatever you tried to do, it was never quite the same as having something come from, from France. And I think with the Lyon silks, just exactly the same thing. Okay. Spitalfields, whoever tried, nobody could, nobody could quite do it. And the, it was a political try, I think, okay. in France. Um, if, if you look that some of the best French furniture ever made was in the, in the last years before the revolution. And um, the royal commissions or the commissions of the royal entourage, um, actually the, the money was not there to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But um, it was sort of to give the public the impression that the financial situation of the state is still sound. Right. But it wasn't. It was a bubble that at one point had had to burst, and um, it ended in the revolution, but it could also have ended in a ec totally economic crisis. We have time for one last question here. I wondered, I was, I wondered at some point, the people, the craftsmen who made furniture, they used to make small models, which they would take with them to show the effect, and did they do it that early, or was it just, uh, they only showed etchings of it. They actually made a, s a small version of the piece of furniture. That's certainly true in America. I'm, I'm not, not familiar with it having been done in Europe. Well, well there are these great quantities of miniature furniture oh, oh, they are. Mm -hmm. from the 18th mm -hmm. century. And um, I don't think we really know what they were made for. I mean, there was a long sort of tradition with dealers to say these were the masterpieces, these, these were the things you had to submit. Well, we absolutely know that isn't true. You had to make something real size, as Wolfram showed, for instance, at the Mines Contortion. Um, they may partly have been toys. Um, but also, I think they probably were just, you know, people collect them now and like yes. them, and I think they did at the time. Mm. I don't think they were models, because they usually aren't, they usually aren't precise enough. You know, they, they just give a general impression. They're usually quite simple. Uh, they can give a bit of marketry. I mean, you get the odd wax model made for a really important royal uh, commission a wax model of a bed or something. That's something very different. That's a model to show the patron the effect that you're trying to achieve. But all these, I don't, I don't know that we know what these no, and you could miniature cha could change what wax. For example, yeah. jewelry cabinet for Maria. Yeah. Right, that was that a model. It changes. It yes. survived. No. And, and the, 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 the chairs from Antoinette, I mean, they were the Gondois ones. Yeah. So those were, but I don't know, all these German miniature commodes and everything, what were they made for? Well, uh, some were clearly made um, or used as, as princely toys, where you have, in, in portraits, you have these children sitting around and, and they are sort of imitating their mother at the dressing table, but I think this is only a sideline. Um, uh, there, there is the idea that um, not to reach the, the master level, but to become a journeyman, maybe, that you had to do something like that. But um, I think uh, very often these, these things, when they are quite accomplished, and there are some, um, that they were made simply to, to be shown to right. a potential customer, mm -hmm. like, a, like a drawing book you had, mm -hmm. like a design book. That's certainly true um, with the companionage movement, which uh, those of you who saw the staircase models exhibition that I did uh, hear from the Thaw collection, uh, that the, uh, that though in the companionage movement in France and a, a little bit in parts of Germany and Switzerland, there was definitely a journeyman process of making a sort of tour of France and proving your work, which involved making these staircase models, but also the people who were working in the arts of 
of, um, of the cabinetry and so forth would often make uh, models as um, sort of tour, tour de force, uh, but of also show a level of mastery, whether it's on the ground level, and also to be received as a full master. And then later on, when they were full masters, to sort of retain their position um, and to show just for the pleasure of making a well-made object. So those there are some known examples in various um, museums of compagnonage in France that include model pieces of furniture which were clearly made to show the craftsmanship and not as toys, but um, they might well have made them once they were doing it for fun um, for a family member to have as a, as a, a miniature thing for fun. But um, there was definitely a method of showing off their, off their skill, so to speak, that was involved, whether it was to a teacher at that level or to a potential client for the work. So I think they had a lot of different functions, and they're also quite different in scale a lot of yeah, I, I mean, there's not a consistency of scale, which is another thing that one would lead to one to think that it was inconsistent as to their use. Mm -hmm. anyway, anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here. This has been a great treat for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.